Aloha, everyone, and welcome to today's Creative Lab Hawaii panel on generating and collecting music revenues for Hawaii artists. I'm Georgia Skinner, Chief Officer of the Creative Industries Division of the Department of Business, Economic Development, and Tourism for the State of Hawaii. You know, we founded Creative Lab Hawaii Accelerator Programs to empower creatives in the media and music industries. And this has built a network of business to business opportunities to export and monetize Hawaii's creative IP, which is, of course, why we're gathered here today. It's fitting to have a champion of intellectual property with us. Please join me in welcoming UH and Kaimuki High grad, Mechanical K. Hirono. Oh, <laughs> uh, aloha. <laughs> aloha. <laughs> As Hawaii's first female senator, the country's first Asian American woman senator, we know mm. from a she believes in the value of our artists as essential to our collective well-being and economic recovery. Senator Hirono has fought on behalf of Hawaii families and communities whose voices are often not heard in Congress. This includes our Hawaii creative entrepreneurs and the leadership organizations that are represented here today. Her work Senate Judiciary Committee and its Subcommittee on Intellectual Property played a key role in the landmark Music Modernization Act resulting in the Music Licensing Collective, the focus of today's webinar. So whether it's building consensus to modernize systems, thank goodness, uh, at the U.S. Patent <laughs> our Copyright Office, or effectively shifting the paradigm for those voices not often heard, I've seen her passion in action, putting her knowledge and skills to work on the national and Hawaii's behalf fronts. Please join me in welcoming Hawaii's own IP champion, Senator <laughs> Okay, Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Georgia. And uh, to all of the uh, participating panelists, uh, if there's one group of people that I really think are fantastic, those are the people who are creating, creating things, music, art, all of that. And so I thank all of you. And yes, yeah, your introduction uh, as to, to uh, uh, the work that I've been doing, mahalo nui loha. But today we are focusing on money that should be going <laughs> to our songwriters, our composers, our lyricists, our, our music uh, publishers, because we, we really worked hard, Georgia, to create the, uh, to pass the Music Modernization Act in 2018, which set up the mechanical or the musical licensing collective. And what this collective does is uh, they're supposed to get get all of the money that is owed to the people that I talked about uh, into the hands of all, all of these people. And, and it comes from the streaming services. And you know, uh, before the law was passed, these streaming services could just put out all your music and you get a zero <laughs> for zero. it and for your creative work. And so last year there was some $424 million that was put into the uh, musical licensing collective and we need to make sure that all of the songwriters the composers and lyricists and the, um, the 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 people that i talked about can get their hands on this money and the way you have to do it is to register and so people i know that the panel will talk about what it takes to register how much money i think amy has registered so maybe she can tell me uh, tell us you know that this is a good thing because uh, Anything above zero for your creative efforts is going in the right direction, right, Amy? So thank you very much for, for all of this. And I will stay on to listen to the uh, discussion and some of the questions that may be put to the panelists. Great, thank you so, so much. Aloha. Oh, really appreciate it. And, you know, it's no small feat and we've enjoyed, Creative Industries enjoyed uh, working with Chris, of course, Hansen and the team in your office in DC, as well as Kei Hao Yap, because mm -hmm. um, they really have kept us in touch and uh, Music Licensing Collective uh, represented today by Chris. Um, I think I'd like to start with him and I'm gonna have each of our panelists introduce themselves first and then mm -hmm. we'll have just do a brief footnote. And then I wanna go to Amy who has had firsthand experience with uh, all of this. So uh, I'm gonna go around the Hollywood squares at the moment. <laughs> Start with Chris, if you can uh, introduce yourself and briefly uh, your role here today. Hi, Georgia, thanks so much. Um, my name is Chris Aaron, and I'm the, uh, the leader of the Mechanical Licensing Collective, the mm -hmm. organization that Senator Hirono mentioned. Um, I'm honored to be here with her today 
um, both because of the leadership that she um, showed in, in helping to pass the Music Modernization Act, and even more so because of her interest in how it goes after the law is signed. I, I suspect that um, um, there are many people who are not as interested in how things work after a law is passed as she was. Um, a year and two months ago, um, I went, went to Washington. I made my only trip to Washington to meet with staff members um, uh, in, uh, in Washington to talk about the work we had then done in the two months I'd been on the job. And um, one of the handful of offices where I had meetings was her office. I met with Jeff Hansen in her office. And um, the reason we had that meeting was because she had expressed an interest in connecting with us while we were there to find out more about it. And so from that initial meeting in Washington um, came the introduction to Georgia. And that led to our first webinar um, that you helped to sponsor. So this is our second time speaking with um, creators in Hawaii. And, um, and of course, it's why I'm so thrilled to be back talking with you here again today. So Senator, thank you for your leadership in this area. It, um, thank you, Chris. It's hard to understate how impactful that is on the lives of creators. Absolutely. Thank you. And, and, and it's something that is so important, that dialogue, <laughs> things that happen after laws are passed. Yes. <laughs> so, oh my gosh, so valuable to us. I can't overstate that. Uh, Nalani, please, next up. Aloha everyone, uh, Nalani Jenkins. I'm um, uh, best known, I guess, as one third of Naleo Pili Mehana. We've played music in Hawaii and recorded for over 35 years. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to thank Senator Hirono for your work on this, uh, this very important process because we were told early in our career that we needed to do um, uh, as many music, write as much music as possible, own all your masters, and that way you can just retire on it. Well. <laughs> music has changed on us, right? And so we need to be able to collect on those things. So thank you very much. I'm also the new kid on the block with Make Music Hawaii, which is a global um, organization that has chapters in over a thousand um, cities around the world and 120 countries. And it was not in Hawaii until we brought it here mm -hmm. as the founding chapter last year. So we're excited oh. to be able to support Hawaii's musicians as well. Yes, and that's coming up on June 21st. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That's right. That's the big event, June 21st. Awesome. awesome. So everyone Perfect, out there listening, please tune in. And it's a great collaboration. All right, Miss Amy Hanaya Lee Gilliam. Hi, aloha. Good morning, everyone. Aloha. Thank you so much, Senator Hirono, for taking care of us here in Hawaii. You know, um, Oh, we're... So I'm president of Hawaii Academy Award Visitor, and I'm an entertainer here in Hawaii, been entertaining over 30 years, and I've really found a passion to lead our Academy of Recording Arts here, mm -hmm. um, just, you know, bringing on medical for entertainers and, and really trying to kind of make them understand a little bit more how, you know, your songs or your intellectual property, you know, it's really important to make mm -hmm. sure you take care of that. And we really are the soundtrack of Hawaii. And um, mm -hmm. I always say that in everything, any Zoom that I'm ever on, that we are the soundtrack of Hawaii. Yes, I am a member already of MLC. I've uploaded my entire, almost my entire catalog. It's a bit overwhelming, but uh, just because I have 15 albums. <laughs> but um, <laughs> it was a learning process. Let me tell you, I feel very liberated to um, have control of my catalog and yeah. upload it and start seeing revenue coming in is very, very exciting. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Chris, for having such great YouTube videos on how to really break it down. <laughs> 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 because the last Zoom that I had with you, it was so overwhelming how to, you know, I'm one of the girl, I'm a visual girl, so I have to pause and go back and pause, you know. <laughs> so the YouTube videos were super, super helpful on how to okay. how to, the actual process works. But I have received income already and I'm very, very excited for that. So thank you very much. Wow, that's great. And just a quick question before we go to Charles for his intro. Um, was there a long time frame before the time you registered and that actual payment coming through? Um, no, it was about really quick. Of like a th about three weeks, you know, it's kind of a process. Um, and what I mean by being liberated is I didn't know, you know, I've, I've been signed to a label my whole life, Mount Napa company. 
and they took care of all you know even though i own mm-hmm. a publishing company they took care of all of my you know mm-hmm. things like that and so it was actually very liberating to understand the process of where everything is going each song has a code you know da 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 but uh-huh. the youtube videos really helped me a lot <laughs> And most of us creatives are visual people, so right. <laughs> let's keep those coming, please. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just uh, have Charles introduce himself, and you know, all of you are being so modest. All of you are multi Hoku award winning artists in your own yes. right, Grammy nominees. So you know, we have a stellar group of, of leaders here today. Charles, take it away. Um, hi, aloha, everybody. Um, aloha. My name is Charles Brotman, and uh, I'm a composer producer here in. Uh, Waimea on Hawaii Island. And I'm also the director of the Creative Lab Music Immersive and uh, president of the Hawaii Songwriting Festival. So I have a Mm. huge interest in making sure that music creators in Hawaii really understand how how to get paid. Uh, And a lot of times we've we see people that have have music out there and they're not um, they're not dotting their I's and crossing their Mm -hmm. T's. um, So they're not receiving Mm -hmm. royalties that they should, that they're entitled to. So uh, that's my, my mission, I guess. Yeah. And um, Senator Hirono, thank you for your your work in this area and other areas that you've been (laughs) um, doing some great things. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. It's uh, one of um, also mentioned to all of the folks that are tuning in that uh, the Q and A is open. You can post your questions, and we'll get to those around fifteen or twenty minutes uh, prior to the end of the session today. So, one of the things that I think is so important, and this inequity of uh, artists being able to capture uh, and own their rights and get compensated for that, get a revenue stream going. Mm-hmm. Just tell us the sort of Cliff Notes version of how this is working. And Nalani, I'm not sure if you've signed up uh, or Charles, but you know, this firsthand account is really helpful for our audience and also for her to hear how it's actually working. Again, she's so committed and her team is so committed to continually following up as Je- I have Jeff on speed dial uh, because <laughs> it is so important that we how this is playing out. So Chris, why don't you give us a a bit of an overview for our audience? Sure. Um, Maybe the first thing I would say is that one of the challenges many creators face is that while when they create, they're making music from a legal standpoint, they're creating different sets of rights. Um, In the case of music, there are the rights in the song that is written and then the rights in the recordings of the performances that are made and many people, it sounds like Nalani is one of them. Um, if you're involved in both the performing and the writing, right off the bat, something that you might do together simultaneously is creating two different sets of rights. And then for each of those rights, um, there can be multiple revenue streams or royalty streams. So in the case of the MLC, we administer a set of rights that relates to the song side of our business as opposed to the recording part of our business. And that's a really important distinction to make because some folks are familiar with um, Sound Exchange, an organization that's similar to us that also um, uh, had its um, origin in some legislation, copyright legislation that was passed several decades ago. And um, Sound Exchange administers a set of rights that relates to sound recordings. So if you are a performer and a songwriter, a very simple way to think about it is you need Sound Exchange and now you need to be connected to the MLC. We don't ever want you to leave a revenue stream behind. Yes. Um, But on the publishing side or the song side, we administer a set of rights called the mechanical rights. And those relate to the copying of a song, the reproduction and the distribution of a song. Um, And that right is implicated by a variety of activities, including those that that have been around for decades, the making and selling of a vinyl record, for example something that I'm certainly old enough to remember um, from when vinyl was the primary format, not the hip format that came back from uh, seemingly from the dead to be now popular with very young people. Um, but vinyl records have, um, have always implicated a mechanical right um, because when you make a vinyl record, you are copying not only the, the sound recording, but also the song that was performed. 
Um, and that type of right dates back to the early 1900s. Um, that mechanical right is a significant revenue stream for songwriters. The other revenue stream that people know about is the performance right. And that right is administered by organizations like ASCAP, BMI, um, GMR, and CSAC, to name four of the largest. So um, for us, again, if you think about that landscape, we're on the song side, not the sound recording side. We administer um, mechanical rights, not performance rights. And within the mechanicals, we focus solely on mechanicals that are due for uses of your songs on digital audio services not video services, video, digital audio services. Chris, can I ask a quick question from one of our uh, community? Uh, can you just direct us to where the YouTube's uh, videos are that Amy was speaking about? It would be helpful for uh, the folks listening in or Amy, if you know, if you can drop it in the Q&A, that'd be helpful. Yes, um, if you go to our website, www.vmlc.com, just like the sign behind me says, um, <laughs> you, can, um, you can find all of our videos. I believe they are now under the resources section, um, but there's quite a bit of informational um, or educational information on the website. Um, it, it, we explain how, how the MLC works. We have um, pages that are focused specifically for self-administered songwriters, those songwriters that act as their own publishers, um, we also have a chart that explains how the digital royalties landscape works. So if you want to see a visual depiction of what I just described, you can actually go to our website and you can see that. Um, so uh, our website is where you can find all that information, the videos, the written materials, the diagrams, and you can also um, contact our support team. Um, we've got more than 20 employees right now that work exclusively on supporting members one-on-one -on -one and uh, they're available 12 hours a day, which includes, um, I know it's early three in the morning your time, but they're there until three in the afternoon, Hawaii time, Monday through Friday. And they're also available on Saturday mornings until noon Hawaii time. Oh. So if you want to, um, if you're doing something during the week, if you have a day job, which a lot of times creators do have, and you don't have time to check in with us, you can always check in with us on Saturday morning. Um, so that's also um, there on the website if you want to contact us. Great, great. Mm -hmm. And Milani, how's your experience been? Um, kind of like Amy, you know, because we've been recording for so long um, on the songwriting side, um, we have 120 songs that we would need to put into the portal. And um, I did log in, I have an account for us. And I, and you know, to be honest, I stopped short. I stopped short there and I and I'm so glad for this reminder for me to like make the time to get back in there and get our stuff in because just like everybody else in the world like musicians we're doing a hundred different things and kind of the last thing we want to do is paperwork or in this case <laughs> digital paperwork right and so um, I guess that was one of my interests in being on the panel was just to encourage all the musicians out there if you know if you're putting it off go do it and if you are um need somebody's help. Um, sounds like Chris has a great team, but maybe you can find a family member or a, a mentor who would help you do it too. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, think, <laughs> I think that's a great point, Nalani, because what it does is, you know, the advent of this uh, initiative and what it means in a sort of holistic, uh, what I would say, ecosphere way for Hawaii's performing artists and, and our uh, songwriters in particular, and maybe Charles can speak to this as well, is that you know, we're re really working hard at Creative Industries to build this support system. So maybe the artists, like yourself, I mean, you, know, you are busy, you're running a new organization, you're reaching out to connect people in the world, uh, but maybe you do need you know, another person, another layer of uh, business support. So you know, Charles, I know you work a lot in, in the realm of you know, nurturing emerging talent, you're a brilliant, you have your own label, and certainly you have uh, found a way to help us connect our music artists with film and television to be able to monetize that. I mean, might there be someone within the uh, sphere of Creative Lab Music Immersive that also, uh, maybe we can start building some of these support systems for our artists with expertise that could, you know, be doing this work for them. Well, I, I, that's certainly possible to do. Um, my, my suggestion 
to um, to the artists out there is don't do what I did and lose track of your repertoire mm -hmm. um, because um, now I'm doing, I do a lot of music for, for film and TV production libraries, that kind of thing. So I have hundreds and hundreds of songs out there generating royalties. And, oh. and I have always been sort of like depending on different publishers because I'm doing co-publishing deals and that kind of thing. But recently I've had to start tracking some of that stuff down for um, a neighboring rights deal that I did in, in the UK and now double checking against the MLC to make sure that publishers mm -hmm. have been registering. And um, wow, it's a mess. I mean, it just takes mm -hmm. hours and hours to put it together. So yeah. um, if, if I had been keeping everything on a spreadsheet and organized from the, from the beginning, um, it would be a lot easier. So that, that's my, <laughs> that's my recommendation. If you're, when you, when you, uh, release a project, whether it's an EP or an album, you, you just, there's only 10 songs or 12 songs that you're, you're, you're working with. So just get them on a spreadsheet with all the information, your PRO numbers, the ISD, uh, hmm. uh, ISRC numbers, ISWC numbers, and then you have it all in one place. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to registration, um, it, it's easy. I would love to just say, um, George, if I would, um, I, I appreciate um, as someone who began my life as a musician and a performer, not, not a data person or, or a, a person leading a company like this, um, that um, it, it can feel intimidating at first because we, we get involved in, in creative things because, um, because that's what we love to do. And you know, I, I still remember um, earlier in my life when some of the recording technology that no doubt, Charles, you use every day, when that first became accessible to people, when you could you know, get a Pro Tool set up on your home computer, oh, yeah. you're getting some of that technology and feeling very intimidated and overwhelmed because it was clearly not as easy for me as sitting down to the piano and playing a song. And yet I understood fundamentally that that was now the way that I needed to to make music. Yeah. Um, but what I would say for the data, and we say this a lot to songwriters, you know your name and you know the names of your songs and you likely know the names of your co-writers. So right off the bat, you have some really important data points that if you only had those are a really good start. Um, and then you know, from there you can build and there aren't that many codes that you have to learn. Charles mentioned a couple of them. The ISWC is essentially a social security number for your song. Every song, uh -huh. once it's registered with a, a PRO, gets assigned an ISWC. And it acts just like your social security number. It's that unique identifier that says that song is that particular song and it's not a different song that has the same title or a similar title. Um, uh, but there are two or three of those types of codes that are really important to learn. And the truth is, you know, you only need about 10 data points, call it 10 or 12, to register a song and to get paid. So um, in that way, start with one. Start with a song you love. Start with a song that's really popular and um, work through the process with that first song. Call us. We'll walk you through it one-on-one. -on -one. And once you've done the first one, my guess is you will find what many people have found is that the second one is not as hard as the first. The third is not as the second, hard as the second. And then, <laughs> uh, as you said, Charles, once you're caught up, what is wonderful now, I guess, about the way this is set up is, you know, every month we'll pay you and that acts as, it's like a dividend, right? Um, or a paycheck. And no. you don't have to set up your data more than once. Once it's there and it's correct, then we do the rest of the work to connect the data coming in with your data to get you paid. So it's an investment that you'll make on the front end that will hopefully then continue to pay you that paycheck every month for decades to come. And certainly that see, is an appealing thing to know that a little bit of effort on the front end will pay rewards for a long time. Yeah, I think that's important. And you know, one of the things that uh, it has come up in the chat is and maybe you can clarify this. Um, how does the MLC services overlap with those of Song Trust? I see that question, Drew. That's a great question that you've asked. So the MLC is the exclusive administrator of these rights, which means that all of the digital services um, that operate um, either streaming or download services in the US, they have to give us some amount of data. And if they're 
operating under the blanket license, they've got to pay us royalties. But, but from us, there are lots of different paths that the money can take. So the first one that we've touched on a bit is if you want to do this yourself as a creator, you can. And our systems are designed to allow any creator to self-administer or self-manage their rights for themselves and get paid directly. Mm. But there are other ways that you can solve for that. Um, and one of them is by hiring a company like SongTrust, which is an administrator. They, they go out into the world and they collect royalties for songwriters um, and then they pay them to the songwriters so the songwriters don't have to do that. Um, you know, you might ask, well, what's the benefit of that if I can go to the MLC? Well, one of the challenges that artists increasingly face is that in a global market where your songs can be available not only in the US, but also in many countries around the world, you may need to go and get money from lots of different organizations. Mm -hmm. and, and under the, the limits set up in the Music Modernization Act, the MLC cannot administer rights outside the US. It's actually okay. not, not that the law couldn't choose to do that, but obviously um, we, our Congress, doesn't have the authority to set the mm -hmm. rules for how rights are exploited and managed in France or other countries. So um, we only collect in the US and if you are earning royalties in other countries because your songs are being listened to um, around the world, you might find an administrator like a song trust to be quite valuable because mm -hmm. they have connections with organi organizations like the MLC in dozens, if not hundreds of countries around the world. So, so that's the answer. A song trust is a great partner that you might choose to use, not only to collect mm -hmm. your royalties from the MLC, but also mm -hmm. from the organizations around the world that also have royalties for you if your music is global. If you're only um, a, a US artist or your music is primarily um, being listened to on the US services, that may not be necessary for you, but that's a choice that you need to make um, based on your business. Mm -hmm. Chris, I, I have a question regarding, uh, regarding song trust also. Uh, I have, um, well, I, I, I'm signed with, with song trust, but I have a lot of music in song trust that isn't showing up when I, when I do the public search on the MLC. Is there anything I can do to make sure that, uh, that that's being taken care of? Yes, um, if you have registered those works with SongTrust, um, then I would reach out to your contact at SongTrust and, um, and ask them uh, to look into that because it is um, certainly possible that something there on their end is not connected um, and, and therefore the data is not yet in our database. But that's a great example of another benefit of, of how this was all set up. And really, I think one of the, 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 the most innovative aspects of the law, um, Congress recognized that um, one of the things that helped or that contributed toward the problems in the industry before was the lack of visibility that the creators had. So for someone like you, Charles, even if you're partnered with a publisher or an administrator, there's still great value for you as a creator and being able to see the data that we're using to administer yeah, yeah. your rights. Um, mm -hmm. And in the past, that might have been harder for you to see. But now you can go to our database. And if anybody wants to do that, you go to our, our website. And at the top right of the home page, there are three buttons. The yellow one says public search. If you click on that button, you're immediately taken to a search screen where you can search our database. Mm -hmm. So you as a published or an administered songwriter can still look and see all the data that we have and then see if things are missing or if they're not correct. And now you can partner with your partners to make sure the data is accurate. In the past, you were only, you were dependent on your partners to get it right. And you know, as much as they may have been doing their best to do that, if they miss something, you wouldn't have known. So that transparency is, I think, an incredible um, advancement for all creators. And again, that that is reflected in the wisdom of the law that was passed. For, uh, Georgia, I have a question for Chris. Sure. So Chris, as a lawmaker, I'd like to know whether the digital streaming services are complying with the law and sending the money to MLC as, it, as they're supposed to. Um, I'm, I'm happy to report that um, overwhelmingly the answer after one month is yes. Um, we, um, we have processed royalties in our first month um, from 36 DSPs. Um, there were seven that, um, that had some challenges, operational challenges, and we're working with them um, mm -hmm. to get those fixed. 
Um, but there were 43 total that could have been paying us royalties. And then the remainder are either DSPs that um, sent in notices to be significant non-blanket licensees. Essentially, they opted to continue to deal directly with rights holders. And the law had accommodation for some small DSPs to do that. Um, and then there are a handful that are download only services that right now are continuing to operate under the pass through mechanical licenses that they receive from record companies. But you know, for our first month of operation to have 36 out of 43 in the distribution um, was pretty extraordinary. And I will also tell you, Senator, that the, the DSPs that we're engaged with, they are trying very hard to get this right. They, they appreciate the benefits that the MLC brings to them. And also mm -hmm. I think appreciate the responsibilities. So we're certainly um, in contact with them every day to make sure that they understand their obligations, to help them fulfill their obligations. And, um, and they have done uh, a very good job um, right out of the gate of, of getting, getting where they need to get so we can pay people. That is great because sometimes we pass laws and uh, we don't know exactly you know, what, what the concerns are regarding implementing the law. So Chris, uh, it's very reassuring that, you are, that things are going uh, well. Yes. A few more, you know, services, streaming services to, to get in on the, uh, to be in compliance, but I think that's really good. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. And I think related to that, um, Kevin Iwamoto had a, a question for you, Senator, regarding uh, what is being done to increase the royalties for the artists. I think currently we're thrilled that we actually have a, a connect mm. the stream to get the to get the beginning, is there any point in the future where they this might be revisited for you and Chris, I guess? Well, I can certainly uh, take a look at it. It did take a, a number of years to <laughs> pass the Music Modernization Act because not everybody was on board, you can imagine. <laughs> so- yeah, You I'll let us so, know who wasn't on board. And I'll take care of that. <laughs> I, I'm, okay. very, I'm very involved in um, uh, the creative aspects of patents and you know all of that, so. Uh, I know that Jeff from my office is on the line, so he can certainly uh, bring me up to speed on the question that you asked. And I can, um, I can certainly fill in some gaps there too. It's um, okay. because this uh, this part of the process um, uh, gets managed by um, a group of judges, the Copyright Royalty Board, mm. that are okay. a part of the uh, Copyright Office, and uh, you know every uh, four years or so, the uh, stakeholders. Um, who have an interest in those rates get together, they come before the Copyright Royalty Board and they make their case for what they oh. think the rate should be. And, okay. um, and that process is um, both still uh, ongoing for the, the period that began in 2018 and then it is just beginning for the, the next uh, four year period um, that I believe will start in 2022. Um, the MLC is not directly involved in that, in that we are not an advocacy organization. We are mm -hmm. by law not permitted to advocate for yeah. um, either side of that equation, but certainly we are um, eager to provide um, over time more data to the parties to inform the negotiations mm -hmm. and um, organizations, um, again, representing both songwriters and publishers are involved in that process as well as the digital services. So, um, okay. Which is Thank you. Really, yeah, very important. Um, I, I want I want to um, address something um, that is important on on legacy, um, and and maybe this is something too that both you know, Amy, I know through your work, and all also with L Nalani, there are uh, so many members of Hara that do represent your legacy artists, your Kapuna. Mm -hmm particular and uh, reading a question here from Eric Gave, aloha kaleo, um, and about the uh, representing uh, Genoa Kiave records and mm -hmm. found mm -hmm. as well, where the in is it possible for the income to be dedicated to the family or foundation through the MLC? Um, so from our perspective, we, we can pay anyone entitled to receive the mechanicals. So if I understand the question correctly, um, if, if a songwriter um, was to set up a foundation and assign their rights to that foundation, the foundation mm -hmm. can be the recipient of mechanicals. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly um, when um, 
when uh, creators pass away, we will often see those rights pass to their heirs, whether it be a spouse or children or others. Um, so yeah, from our standpoint, there's nothing to prevent that. Um, it's really up to the rights holder to decide how they want that royalty stream uh, to be directed. The one thing that we probably don't do is um, we don't, you know, there, if a creator came to us and said, I want to divvy up my royalty stream among 20 different people this year and I want to change it, you know, we, we don't provide that level of administrative service. But certainly if the rights are assigned, we can accommodate that. And that does happen from time to time. Awesome. Yes. Um, George, if Sorry. I may say something real quick. Yes, please, so in please. HARA, in Hawaii Academy of Recording Arts, we have close to over almost 380 members now, Academy members, songwriters, entertainers. Mm -hmm. And we really have um, like a three tiered level of entertainers that are part of our Academy. The millennials, my generation, and then the Kupuna generation. And the Kupuna generation are some of our greatest writers in the mm -hmm. history of Hawaii. And so I've been talking really um, at length with Brickwood Galateria because he formed Kupuna Power. Mm. And it's a concert service at Windward Mall that helps oh. the tutus or the elders, um, mm -hmm. you know, with their Medicaid, Medicare, all that kind of stuff. Huh? But I asked him, I said, you know, is there possibly a way that we can have I was concerned about, you know, uh, keeping up copyrights and things like that of the elders. But I think that the MLC could work definitely as well because they're certainly being streamed, you know, like crazy, mm -hmm. the old timers. Mm -hmm. And so if I may, I think I may talk with Brickwood about having, um, so what, what Kupuna Power is, is the tutu walks in and they actually, there's three desk concierge service where they can actually talk one-on-one -on -one with mm -hmm. somebody on how to do something. Mm -hmm. So I've already talked with him about the copyright and ASCAP and BMI and making sure all that's up. But I think that the MLC needs to be part of that as well. You know, um, helping them upload all of their information mm -hmm. into into the MLC catalog. Mm. But I'm almost thinking, I had this idea of doing like um, Hanai, Hanai Adopt a Tutu, you know, mm. like the millennial, like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like have yeah. them help the older generation, <laughs> you know, with their copyrights and publishing yeah. and um, and MLC and how, help them upload it into the MLC. So mm. I think, you know, that would, that would work really well. I'll talk with Brickwood at length about that. Yeah. You know, Andy, one of the um, the things that we have been working on behind the scenes, and admittedly um, was was impacted by the pandemic, um, but that's been to um, to set up student clinics on college campuses, particularly where students are studying music business, um, so that students um, can be trained on how to. Um, walk people through the membership process and how how to register works or clean up their data or upload their data um, to the portal um, and then do that, provide that service to local creators in their community. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm not um, uh, familiar offhand with whether the University of Hawaii has a dedicated music business program, but I know the University of Hawaii is a phenomenal um, uh, institution, a system of higher education with several campuses. So. I, I have no doubt that there are probably mm -hmm. students who would find that interesting. And that's something that I would love to pursue. Um, and that's something that we've begun to contemplate mm -hmm. with other colleges mm -hmm. as well. Um, and that yes, I think does exactly what you've described and that it connects younger people with older people in their communities. Um, it allows those young people to learn about the business and at the same time serve, um, provide a service to people in their community that um, is valuable. And in that way, we both educate the next generation and serve um, those that have come before us. That is a very, very important point. And I think through the music and entertainment learning experience at UH uh, Hawaii Community College, or excuse me, Honolulu Community College, um, you know, they have been part of our initial rollout, Chris, with, with you folks. I think there's something there for all of us to follow up on. So we'll keep the and everyone in the loop on that because that again starts to get into our community and be able to perform services <laughs> for Kapuna. Mm -hmm. You know, there are others, and, and I know uh, the senator will have to leave us in a few minutes, but I wanted to just pull this uh, out of the chat uh, from David Jeremiah. 
Uh, Aloha, I have a song that has been registered with the Library of Congress that has been used to establish well-known artists from Hawaii that had access to my music and released it under the same name as I registered it as. What steps do I take to get the proper credit and get compensated for my work? I think, David, we may have to have that answer later, but that's a that's something that you know might affect others that are uh, dealing in the you know, in this realm. Well, I can certainly speak to parts of it and say that um, one important thing to note is registering your work with the Copyright Office doesn't also automatically register that work with any organization like the MLC. So um, for example, if you were to register the copyright in a song you've written, you still need to um, sign up with a PRO like an ASCAP, a BMI, a CSAC or GMR and provide your data to them. You need to do the same for the MLC. So um, a good takeaway is don't um, make the assumption that because you've registered your copyright that you have now automatically been set up to be paid by anyone who uses your song. Um, the good news is it, it doesn't sound like that um, artist is um, claiming the work for themselves. It seems like they're mm -hmm. giving you credit. So it may be as simple as you're registering um, the song with us and becoming a member of the MLC and, uh, and then making sure that we know the name of the artist who uh, recorded your song so that when we get the data from the digital services, we can be sure to match all of the uses of that song um, or that recording with your song and that will get you paid. Mm -hmm. So um, again, that's something that if you'd like to talk more with us, I'd encourage you to contact our support team and we can talk with you a little bit more about that. Maybe um, look at the details a little more closely in a way that it's hard to do now um, through the Q&A. So um, I hope you'll contact us, David. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, for for uh, I'm so thrilled to see so many questions. So keep them coming. You know, we're going for a while uh, because that's what it's about. It's about dialogue with all of us. And uh, especially what's important today, I think, um, Senator, for you is just to, to have a sense of uh, what what able to happen here in Hawaii, uh, in your community, right. uh, working hard to uh -huh elevate this industry it is hawaii's number one i believe export in the world and we still yeah. have artists that are hurting we have artists that have not been working for over year you know years mm -hmm. and years. um this is still a big mm -hmm. issue even s fog doesn't really begin to scratch the surface in fact it not mm -hmm. even of those yes yeah. i just wanted to give you an opportunity to you know just have some um some thoughts about where things could go in the future Thank you, Georgia. And uh, uh, Chris, especially, thank you for your very specific uh, pieces of information. And, uh, and for all of our artists, thank you for sharing with us the experiences that you've had with uh, MLC. And, and I'm always looking for ways that we can improve the, the, the law if necessary. And, and so, yes, I, I know that our community has really been challenged by the pandemic. Uh, the, some of the laws that we've enacted and implementing, they've run into some uh, challenges to say the least. So thank you very much. And, and, and really Georgia or uh, any of you, if you have uh, specific issues that come up that you think we can be helpful at my office, uh, the person to call is Alan Yamamoto, who is my chief of staff in Hawaii. So mahalo everybody, stay safe, be kind. Talk Thank you, you so much, time. Senator. Aloha. Aloha. And enjoy your time while you're in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. And so back to uh, our conversation, Nalani, I wanted to touch on a little bit of what's happening with, um, you know, as you said, you kind of had to stop uh, for a minute, right? And you're going to get back into it with, with the opportunity. But um, similar to Brian Kessler's um, question, I mean, are you also a member of Sound Exchange, CDB, and ASCAP, and, and what do you see as the advantage of joining MLC? I mean, does it complement that? Is it something that you feel strongly about? Um, for me and for Naleo, we, um, we've been members of Sound Exchange for a while now, and they're really a great organization, and they helped us to realize royalties um, from uh, music that was streaming on the internet, right? Um, but 
it's it's really for the SR side, for the sound recording side. And if I understand, Chris, uh, the MLC is strictly for the um, the PA side, for the composer's rights. And that. and we do have um, publishing deals as well um, for some of our the countries that we record in. But it's so fragmented. All the artists know this. It's a crazy puzzle that you try to piece together. And, um, and I can see that the MLC would be really useful for um, at least me and the other two members of our group to register our personal copy mm -hmm. for our songs. Yeah. It's a missing piece. I, I'm sure we have royalties out there that we haven't gotten paid for. We're, we're at least now a one-stop shop for the, again, the mechanicals that relate to those digital services. It doesn't solve everything, but it, it is a, a big piece now where before it was more fragmented. Mm -hmm. And for, um, uh, this is a question from Gaylord Holomalia. Um, does the MLC help with securing rights? Um, go, anyone? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, the, <laughs> right. uh, the, again, Congress established a blanket license. Essentially, that license allows any digital service that fulfills the requirements to get the license to use any song in the world um, on their US digital audio services. And again, there are limits on what is covered by that, but, um, but that essentially um, represents the scope of what we do. So the MLC is not able to um, administer additional rights that are not covered by the scope of the blanket license. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but um, so yes, yeah, so if you're, if you're looking um, for uh, someone to administer your video rights or to collect your mechanicals overseas, you have to look for a different organization to do that, unfortunately. Yeah, because it does seem like there are questions about that too in the uh, area of uh, Hawaiian music and it being used on foreign websites without compensation. Uh, that question come to me several times too. So, uh, you know, where should I refer people? Any of you um, would be helpful. Again, that's where organizations like Song Trust, um, CD Baby Pro was mentioned, TuneCore, um, you know, there, there, there are a lot of companies now that are operating in that space that um, offer the service of going out and getting your royalties um, around the world. Um, it is hard to do, and um, and I don't um, endorse any one over the other. Um, but but I would recommend you look in the direction of those companies if you're looking for that type of solution, or um, of course a publisher. You know, if you can um, find a publisher, that is what publishers do. They they go out into the world and they look for money that relates to those songs and. Um, you know, some of the oldest publishers have been doing this for many decades, and they've got global networks um, that they've set up um, that allow them to do that uh, quite effectively. So um, I say that knowing that um, it's not as simple as I'll just go out and get a publishing deal because there aren't publishing deals for everyone in the world. But um, if you are in a position where you are considering that as an option, know that that is one of the benefits to having a publisher. Um, and then the third thing, and maybe this speaks to something that um, we touched on earlier, but I, I, there are independent administrators. There are quite a few in Nashville, um, where I'm based, which is where a lot of songwriters historically were based in publishing companies, but there are in, independent administrators in the world, um, out in the world, who will do this as a service for you. Um, and that's a third option. And I do think there are opportunities now um, for, for new administrators to build businesses. So forgive me because it's um, a pandemic and we're all here yes. at home, but <laughs> I, uh, one of my cats got in the office with me. We um, love I, animals here. As do I. Um, and she's, she's a cute one, I think, as they go. Um, <laughs> There are opportunities, real opportunities for folks who, um, who understand how this works and are good with data and wanna serve creators to, to, to build businesses doing this. And I think in Hawaii, that could be a wonderful opportunity because of course, um, it may be hard for you to connect with an administrator based in Nashville and it may be hard for them to know that you need that service, but there are no doubt people here um, you know, uh, in the islands um, that have that skill set and that ability and, um, and that's something I think that's very exciting. You know, I think that's a great takeaway for all of us, Charles, Nalani, Amy. Um, I, I feel like 
there's an opportunity here to build a more cohesive um, hub for this kind of information on the easy side. You know, every website that we all uh, have something to do with should have a, a direct link to the MLC and a little bit of a page on, on uh, how we've you know, responded to some of these questions as well. So it's almost like a new FAQ that we can update. And then for Chris, I mean, I really would like to know where all of the um, Indian administrators are in Nashville, because there's a lot of synergy with Hawaii and Nashville. And I think to start there, it would help our community grow. Uh, and we could aggregate that at least on our creative industries and creative lab sites. I'm sure Charles can do that on his uh, Hawaii Songwriters Festival and Nalani on her uh, Make Music Hawaii site. So just a, a thought, what do you guys think about that? Yeah, yeah. I love it. I mean, not like we don't have, like you don't have anything to do with it. No, well, and I there's um, a great a songwriter organization here, Nashville Songwriters Association International. Um, yes, Bart Herbison, the head of that organization, sits on our board. We work right. very closely with Jennifer Turnbow, um, and I, I can certainly connect with them because I know that they will know a number of those. Right. You know, we don't. I don't yet have a list of those administrators. And again, for us, the, the challenges. Um, I always want to be careful. I don't, I don't want to endorse any one business, but I'm always quick to say there are lots of ways that creators can connect with us and solve this problem. And, and certainly the more we can put information about all those different options out in the world, the better. So whether it's directly or indirectly, I, I think we can help you find some names. And I'm sure that those administrators would welcome the connection because it's business for them and they're in the business of helping all of you. But, uh, but I still think there's a great opportunity for some Hawaii-based um, folks as well. And, and that's yes. in some ways the real power of, of what we're doing is it is really, although we are a centralized organization, we are pushing out the, the, the ability to do this to all rights holders, wherever they are. Um, you know, you have the same ability to interact with us via the portal, to register your works, to manage your works that a creator in, in Nashville does, a creator in New York, a creator in Miami, uh, a creator in, um, in, in Paris. And, and in that way, we take the geographic component out of the mix and we level the playing field. Um, but that still doesn't mean there isn't value in having those experts in your community. So through the student programs and those networks, I think we can build. I think it helps to demystify because I mean, even people that have expressed interest in like, how do they get into, this is a question for Charles, um, you know, and me, I guess, and all of us, you know, what's the best way to get my music to be considered for movie and TV soundtrack inclusion? And I know how important metadata is in any of those placements. I mean, how familiar are all of our artists in uh, the uh, world of Hawaii music, whether it's legacy music uh, or uh, emerging artists, how familiar are they with, with those tools that need to be, uh, get them ready to pitch, right? And I know that's what Creative Lab Hawaii does, but Maybe speak to that, Charles, a little bit. And I think Nalani and Amy have had experience in this as well. Well, you definitely um, need to understand um, the basic copyright issues and, and who owns uh, the underlying recording, who, who owns the master, who owns the, um, the composition itself. And you need to be able to, um, to sign off on that and say, yes, I'm, I'm the owner or I have... Um, I'm able to represent this uh, piece of this piece of music. Otherwise, you can get yourself into trouble pretty pretty quickly. Um, and that um, relates to the metadata because when you're pitching that music, you want to have the metadata correct, and um, you need to have the not only not only the information about the ownership of the copyrights, but you want to be you want to have your own contact information and that type of thing in there as well. Probably want to indicate whether it is one stop, whether that person that you're pitching to can get a yes or no answer from you and not have to chase down five, five people and five different contract, contact, contracts. So those are just some of the basic issues involved in that. Um, you know, a lot of it too is just um, networking, you know, being, um, being in a situation where you're meeting people that are involved in that part of the business. Um, we were talking a, a little bit earlier about um, about the uh, younger versus older artists here in Hawaii, and 
Um, mm-hmm. And I, you know, I've really noticed that with the Melee program and some of these other programs that the uh, younger uh, uh, artists tend to know a lot more about how this works than the older artists. But the, um, the irony there is that the older artists have are the ones that have the bigger catalogs. So um, I think what, back, back to your earlier point, Amy, I think that it would really be helpful to be able to get this information out to, to mm-hmm. some of the older artists that do have big catalogs. Really, and maybe integrate those Mele students and others to work with Hara and with Make Music Hawaii and your organization, Charles. Like the, you know, I can see a very vibrant uh, initiative developing here with Kapuna Power, uh, where there's almost a site that is, you know, uh, certainly on the web as well as in the physical space at, uh, where uh, Berkwood has his uh, Kapuna Hale over there. And, uh, and doing it virtually, I mean, that is a big hang up, obviously, with some of our legacy artists. Um, it is difficult uh, at times, and, and even, you know, uh, Halau and others who uh, feel that, you know, Kumus are not necessarily inclined to do anything that's not in person, which is good. You know, and I heard that from Vicky Takamine Holt that, you know, it's, they're just waiting, you know, until it's safer, right? But we're getting there. Um, on the can you just list a couple of the more progressive music placement companies that you've worked with, Charles? And I don't know, uh, Amy or Nalani, if you have some suggestions for uh, Kevin Iwamoto. Well, um, you know, we've with the um, Creative Industries Division, we've, we've partnered with Secret Road and Marmoset, Riptide Music, um, some other companies. But what the interesting phenomena is that um, these companies are just exploding on on the internet. If you Google music licensing company, it's every day. There's more everywhere. Companies. <laughs> They're everywhere. Yeah. So you know. Um, and no, we did not have a crystal ball for this. It just kind of <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So and they're you know they're all looking for uh, for great songs and um, great performances of great songs. So if you've got music that you think will be placeable I yeah ch- chase down those agencies and um, mm. try to get you try to get your music somebody representing your music um, Georgia I wanted to plug an opportunity for our songwriters um, in Hawaii um, make music Hawaii is a program called my song is your song last year we had 32 Hawaii composers that were able to um, participate and they would register and then they trade a song with another composer and then that composer performs their song and vice versa and then we did videos and put them out you know it's just a way to get your music out there and share it with the world this year for make music hawaii um we've partnered with new york city and so the hawaii uh, composers who sign up are going to get paired with new york composers and they're going to get to swap their songs and hear somebody else sing theirs and be able to perform the other person's song. So I think it's going to be a fun event this year. Very cool. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, Georgia, Georgia yeah. I'm, I'm almost thinking, you know, just kind of thinking outside the box a little bit. Maybe maybe Hara and Creative Industries can kind of hui together and create like a database of mm-hmm. uh, songwriters and uh, I don't know, there's something there that I think maybe we can create yeah. for the music, awesome. you know, for the film industry the as community. well. Mm-hmm. Like a date, like a database of. Definitely. Let me think about that. That might be a very, yes. really good um, thing it's to create. Partnership all the way around because we certainly need it. And uh, um, yeah, there's a nexus and we have a willingness to want to push something out like that. So uh, let's take that up. I'd like to acknowledge Kalani Pea, aloha, Mr. Grammy. Uh, I do not have purple on today, but I honor you in the color. <laughs> it is blue, not quite purple. Uh, some of us musicians had to work with TuneCore to share Hawaiian music and get sync licensing. How can we know that Hawaii organizations can truly help the musicians of Hawaii? It seems like many of us work with TuneCore to pitch our music and it has been successful. So. Um, I wasn't aware. Uh, thank you, Kalani, for uh, for the info. Why don't we all comment on that? I, mean, I didn't know well, Tim Porter was doing that. 
Yeah, I've I've heard that that on occasion um, they'll pitch and somebody will get will get a placement, but it's probably not a primary way of doing it. It might be a more a more direct way would be to have a licensing agent representing your your music. Um, that's my my two cents on that one. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Great. Um, I agree with Charles. We use TuneCore as well, and I haven't found that to be a real strong, a strength of their service, although they do have good services for collecting royalties. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. You know, you know, Georgia, I think it, it, it would be a start to bring the film industry in Hawaii to the table, too, with you, with me, with Hara, to create that database, you know? Well, it's important to do. And I think the database is something that, you know, I'd like to acknowledge Tracy Young, who is the lead in our office for music yeah. industry development, as well as design and fashion. And she has long, you know, she is the champion. She and Car Charles work closely together on the implementation of resources for the Creative Lab Music Immersive and for the Hawaii songwriters, dating back to when it was Kauai songwriters. <laughs> but I... I can tell you that it is an intent of creative industries to do that. It has been for some time. And I feel that there is a willingness with our community. Uh, there are wonderful apps that are out there and also a website right now called Actors High. And that model is already existing. I think that there are ways to do this to be able to easily update and be able to use it as a platform for connectivity. Uh, to those that can either with the MLC, Chris, or uh, also with licensing companies. I think our biggest challenge from creative industry standpoint was getting the industry to understand or getting the uh, collective industries to understand that the creative economy in Hawaii is comprised of all of us. It's not something that film is here and, you know, music is here. It's all, it's all part of a holistic um, living, breathing universe. So I think MLC has helped us tremendously in, in getting closer to where we need to go. But this year, yes, the answer is yes. That was my long way of answering yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Chris, did you want to um, address, I know there are, uh, there what is a question here from Kathleen, which is talking about, um, and I, I don't believe that this is correct, but it, it will be good information to share. Um, she's a singer uh, and not a songwriter yet. Uh, is it possible to record songs that are in public domain and receive royalties from music streaming platforms, uh, unless you own it? Uh, what is included in the process in addition to recording then registering with MLC? So Kathleen's question is a great one because it, it sort of goes back to um, the beginning of the panel today and the importance of understanding the different sets of rights. So as a singer who is not yet a songwriter, um, the only rights, Kathleen, that you would have would be the rights in the recordings of the performances that you make. Um, you may own those recordings because you may be doing them yourself or hiring someone to do it or going to a studio where you um, you essentially rent the studio out to make those, or you could be making those uh, recordings for a record company or someone else who owns them. Um, either way, um, you would not have any rights in the songs, um, so you would not need to become a member of the MLC. You can, as a singer, perform songs that are in the public domain, and if you do that, then you don't have an obligation to pay any royalties on the song side because what it means for a song to be in the public domain is that the copyright um, has expired in that work such that anybody can use it and does no longer needs uh, permission from mm -hmm. the original rights holder. Um, that tends to be for older songs. As many of you know, the term of copyright now is up to 95 years in this country. It's a bit complicated, but it's, it's a lifetime. Um, so there, are, um, there aren't that many songs that are in the public domain. Um, but if you were performing a public domain song, you could use that free of charge. Um, one other point that I just saw that may be somewhat related, and I'll just quickly add on to this. Um, uh, another uh, person said, so if, if I'm connected with TuneCore, um, is it beneficial to register with the MLC? If TuneCore is representing your publishing too, meaning if you not only use TuneCore to distribute your sound recordings, but also to administer your publishing, 
And that is an option. It is a service that you can elect to have them perform for you. Then for those songs that they represent both sets of rights on, you do not need to become a member of the MLC. However, you can still look in our database for your songs to make sure that they're registered properly with TuneCore listed as the administrator, because that's what will confirm that they're getting paid. If you wrote a song and you gave it to TuneCore to administer along with the sound recording, but you see in our database that they are not listed as the administrator of your song, that means that we don't know to pay them and therefore they can't pay you. So again, um, if you're using TuneCore for publishing, you don't need to be a member of the MLC for those songs, but you can still check your data and we would encourage you to do that. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of people, you know, this is not one size fits all. I mean, you, it's a relationship business. So, you know, if TuneCore works for you, then TuneCore works for you. If there is an opportunity where MLC can be an advantage, great. You know, I think the more advantages we can push to our artists, legacy and emerging, that can get revenue, uh, generate revenue for them on their creative works, that is where our passion lies, certainly at Creative Industries. That's the whole reason for us existing, is that we care about getting the compensation to the artists. I can remember when I started in this job in 2007 and talking to Mount Apple about some of the many issues regarding you know, the lack of any kind of revenue stream coming from you know, music and elevators that are all Hawaiian music and, and many things like that. I mean, look how far we have come, I guess, today as a community, thanks to some you know, national legislation that is actually a uh, law and MLC is activating. So I think that's really Im important. Um, and you know, I think that there is a, there's a shout out from Faith Rivera. Hi, Faith. Um, and uh, good to see you online. Um, that, uh, you know, you got some help uh, also enlisted uh, as an arranger. So that's good. Um, and that is correct, Faith. It, you, can, you can be paid mechanicals if you're, if you're the arranger of a public domain work. That is a nuance that I did not cover with Kathleen, um, but it's a great point. Um, and another example of how um, there's very little that's straightforward or simple in our business, but I'm glad that we were able to help you um, get that set up and glad that we'll be paying you for the great creative work you've done as an arranger. That's wonderful. Yeah. And um, one last question I have before we um, branch into just two more that I see that have come up. Um, you know, be thinking about what do you see as the future? And this goes to Chris as well. You know, how can we strengthen and create a much more vibrant uh, music ecosphere with all of us working toward a, a common goal of revenue share, but even more so, how do we elevate the dialogue about, this is a critical industry for Hawaii, yet it's the most disproportionately affected during this pandemic. What do we do? Um, you know, decision makers to understand this at all levels. I think, I think there is actually um, quite a bit of good news happening there, despite the immense challenges that all of us have faced this year, but particularly creators. Um, I think uh, your senator and others um, do see those needs, and we have seen legislation passed um, that, that benefits creators, that allows them to take advantage of some of the benefits um, that, that were created for small business owners, um, you know, often we don't think of um, creators um, the same way that we think of the person that operates the local coffee shop or the hardware store, but, you know, musicians are small business owners just like them. They just, they don't happen to have a, a physical location that they operate. So I think a lot of the legislation that this year that has been passed, um, um, you know, under the guise of pandemic relief has um, has taken that into account, has been made available to creators. Mm -hmm. There's certainly been a lot of legislation now focused around um, uh, people involved in the live event space. Um, I know of creators that have gotten PPP loans um, to help pay their staff if they you know, have a, a band that they maintain for touring and recording purposes. So um, I would encourage you to you know, contact organizations like yours, Georgia, 
um, creative mm -hmm. industries or advocacy organizations like NSAI and Nashville who are advocating for you um, to make sure you're aware of all the benefits that do exist. Um, and then, you know, beyond that, um, uh, I think the outreach, um, you know, that we're doing, these conversations help to remind people of the importance of the creative community. That's certainly something I'm passionate about. And, and I think as we move to a, a global marketplace, um, the value creators becomes greater because now your music can be appreciated by people all around the world mm -hmm. um, in a way that, you know, perhaps 20, 30 years ago, your challenge was how do we get our music off the island into the mainland? And now, um, again, the digital environment allows you to, to leap right past the mainland into Europe and Asia and to every corner of the world, um, which is wonderful. Um, and as more and more people listen to your music um, and are inspired by it, I think that itself um, improves the uh, perception of value. Right, which is, I think, something that, you know, Nalani has is, is mentioned already, and it's something that she's passionately working on. So I think that's wonderful. Charles? Yeah, I, well, I, I think that, I don't, I don't have any st statistics on this, but I'm sure that music from Hawaii is being streamed um, in multiples outside of Hawaii, much more, much more of our music is being streamed outside of the state than it is in the state. So as, as these, uh, these sources of revenue open <laughs> up like M MLC and neighboring rights and, uh, um, and so on, uh, it just, it's just good news for, for Hawaii music creators. It just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, should be an incentive for people to keep, keep creating and building their catalogs. Mm -hmm. And Nalani, I uh, just wanted to touch on this with you. Um, it, it is something that I think what you're doing, what Chris was talking about, the awareness of Make Music Hawaii and what you're bringing to the forefront with the, um, I don't want to mess it up now, my song is your song. Um, you know, that's, that's a, a key aspect. I think that is, you know, one advocacy uh, element that is like the front door to getting people to understand globally the value here, if you will, and then creating a more robust kind of database hub virtually uh, so that all of the things that we've been talking about today can reside at one place and have uh, connectivity with, with all organizations that are doing things that are important in the industry. Yeah, it's that concept of rising tide, you know, uh, floats all the boats, right? I mean, I think musicians we are we're creatives and we're lovers it's like we we're in this competitive industry but there's a lot of uh personality in here and people that just want to help each other um so i think hawaii especially has that fondness and so whatever we can each do within our own wheelhouse that strengthens uh the whole mm -hmm. i think makes us all better oh that's great um georgia yeah there's been a huge elephant in the room, which is ASCAP and BMI here in Hawaii for years. Yes, well, yes let's and, talk about that. Right. I'm just, you know, I just, we've always been told that we don't have a representative here in Hawaii for ASCAP and BMI. When, when music is played in our elevators, on the radio, and I, I just have never, never really understood that. Um, uh, whole process of, of why right. our artists are not getting their ass share in BMI. Chris, do you have any insight on that? Because I mean, I have a little backstory, but what's happening today? Um, no, I, I don't really have insight other than to say that, um, you know, ASCAP and BMI and the other PROs, um, one of the challenges that they face that we don't face is that they, um, they both have to compete for um, members um, and they have to cover their administrative costs out of the royalties they collect. The MLC under the law um, uh, pays 100% of the royalties through to rights holders because the digital services are required to pay our operating costs. Um, and that's unique. We're the only CMO that I'm aware of in the world that is paid for by someone other than the rights holders. The norm is to have those organizations cover their costs through the admin fees. So, um, you know, the one thing I will say is um, they they have the challenge of always having to, um, you know, decide how to spend money. 
I certainly won't speak to, nor would I defend um, any any perception that they have not thought it was worth spending money in Hawaii. But um, but I do know that their challenge is um, how do they represent a wide group of stakeholders um, and not set up individual offices in every state in the country, um, which again could be very cost prohibitive and ultimately diminish the amount of royalties that everyone receives. That's a very difficult position to be in. and. Um, and again, thankfully, we don't have to be in that position, which is why I can't wait to see you all in person. Yes. Well, I, I can say one thing for, oh, sorry, hey, Amy, go ahead. No, I was just saying, you know, Hawaii is very small and we have a lot of either family members or friends in very unique places like radio stations and things. And I know our radio stations are paying thousands beyond millions of dollars to play our music mm -hmm. and we're still not seeing it from ASCAP and BMI all these years. All these years. And, you know, obviously Bobby Pelagi brought this up when I first started in the, in the job. And it's something that as our, we did have initial conversations with ASCAP, we, um, you know, asked them, why are you just going by a formula as opposed to a uh, more robust kind of um, you know, and, and between 2007, there was less aggregation of broadcast um, and uh, radio and television. So it was less of a, um, you know, more corporate influence of outside uh, entities, which, you know, there's good and bad about that. I mean, there's, there's positives and, and negatives. But I think it's something we have to take up. I mean, I think it's time for creative industries to look into that and get a group together. Also, I think, Chris, you know, for things like this, is there a time of year? I mean, I know that the Americans for the Arts always has a, you know, Arts on the Hill event. Uh, normally, I believe it's February, um, but I could be mistaken. Is there a time of year um, in, in your estimation? And this could also be answered by Kay Howe or, um, you know, Jeff, and we can follow up and put it on our uh, communication out on our uh, Facebook page. But you know, is there a time of year where we should be really looking at work on the Hill collectively? Uh, I, I'm not sure that there's a regular time every year, but I do know that um, advocacy organizations like NSAI on the songwriter side and NMPA on the publisher side um, are in, uh, in Washington quite regularly. Um, I believe the Recording Academy does a Grammy on the Hill event each right. fall in September. Um, and, and so, you know, I would recommend, um, you know, connecting with those national organizations that do have a presence in Washington or, or, or have events already to plug into them. And, you know, a lot, a lot of times it's often just a question of what's being discussed at the moment. So when the Music Modernization Act was being discussed, um, you know, it was when, when there was an opportunity to get that audience with a group of legislators, um, and that is often when when you can get that audience. Um, so um, you know, right now I think we're in a quiet moment. Um, on the well, I shouldn't say that. Maybe there's some legislation percolating, percolating but um, I would start with those national organizations: NMPA and NSAI, mm -hmm. Recording Academy, um, all of whom do great work advocating for creators. Mm -hmm. And, and I you know, think Georgia, for the arts too. Mm -hmm. You know, Georgia, I think our biggest advocate is Maisie. I have done music on the Hill for her before Willie and I did. And I yeah. think that if, if we can put a bug in her ear about it, about this issue, I think it would be huge. Yes. You yeah, well, know, let's, let's do that. That'd be a great action item from our dialogue today is that I think that it's important to be there more than once. I think that Hawaii on the Hill is an important event. Uh, I know the chamber is very involved. I would like to work through on this and uh, also through the rest of our congressional delegation because they do believe in the uh, the creatives and, and their role, our creative economy's role in recovery and resiliency. In June of this uh, last year, uh, Brookings Institute released a report that was clearly um, you know, the devastation of what it was called as lost art, the impacts on the creative economy of COVID-19. And Hawaii is one of five states that are disproportionately affected by the pandemic and still are. I mean, you and I know full well from personal experience that there are people that have fallen off the edge because of this that are artists and 
uh, brilliant talents in, in the world. So I think that it's important for us to not only be there for the, you know, the Hawaii on the Hill event, but let us look at maybe part of this coalition that is coming together uh, thanks to the Hawaii Arts Alliance and one of the uh, efforts that uh, was called the Creative uh, Resurgence Group during our legislative session and now is a, a creative art, we do have a creative artist network uh, base. Thank you, AJS, for posting this to remind me. Uh, we are hopeful that the legislation will pass. What it will do is create a, a creative task force. Uh, so all of you watching, um, this will be coming up uh, in the next fiscal year, so after July. And this group here will be an important part of representing the music um, quadrant of Hawaii's creative economy. Uh, we also are looking into ways in which to work with the uh, Legislative Reference Bureau. And this is another resolution that was passed by the Senate uh, here locally, thanks to many champions there as well as in the House. Uh, and so that will be something where we look at the definition of a creative worker and a gig worker so that we, again, do not have the same devastating effects that a UI and the PUA programs had on our creative community where people could not access money and they were desperate. So I'm very excited about that. Um, I have a quick um, question here from Stevenson. Where do I go to register for composer, singer, songwriter? For rights, for not quite sure on the question. If it's, if it's to become a member of the MLC, just go to our uh, website and uh, click on the blue button on the top right that says connect to collect. Oh, to rights. Okay. Thank you, Stevenson. All right, great. Um, I know we have to wrap up in a couple of minutes. So I just like to um, offer any last thoughts on the hope for the future. Where do you see the opportunities for Hawaii and the music industry and its role in recovery? What's the hope? Well, I think the hope, I think one of the hopes is the second you get on an airlines to come to Hawaii, it's playing music of Hawaii. So we set the tone for people coming to Hawaii, which I think is very special. Um, I can't imagine being on a flight with no music, you know, oh my God. or in a rental car or anywhere else you're here in Hawaii. And I think right now we need to strike while the iron is hot and talk with Maisie and, and get you know, this is a, a time to, I think, Huli, our music industry here. Huli, um, Chris means to like turn over. <laughs> um, and Hello, really, Lance. you know, really, I, I think this pandemic has really been able to have people step back and really analyze and evaluate everything. Um, in a way, it's a curse, but in, in a way, it's a blessing. And um, I think now while the iron is hot, now, now we strike and, you know, have ASCAP and BMI answer these questions. And if we have to go through Maisie to do it, I'm sure she would aloha us for that. And, you know, now that we have this very strong collective who we on this side too, I think it's a, it's a really good hope. Great, Amy, thank you. And I know you have a lot plan for Hara and its new evolution. Uh, congratulations on all the work that you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. With our industry on that. And Ms. Thank Nadal. you. You know, I'd, I'd like to share that, you know, um, I heard this once that, you know, there's a million or so people live in Hawaii. There's probably 10 million visitors a year. Not anymore, but, you know, they'll come back. But there are over 100 million people around the world, plus, plus, who um, have an affinity for Hawaiian music, who have either visited in the past, uh, former residents, whatever. And so I think the opportunity is all the things we've learned during COVID and, um, and how to utilize Oops, you're frozen. That's exactly what she's saying. Utilize and work together. Absolutely. I'm feeling um, you there. Uh, we lost you a little bit in a sort of freeze. So if you could just go back and restate. Weird. Um, I was just saying there's over 100 million um, people that love Hawaiian music. Just keep making it. Yeah. I, 
Carol, very important. Charles. Yeah, I think, um, you know, just kind of looking at the last couple of decades, I mean, those of us that were in the music business um, that have been in for a while, I mean, we saw, we saw it pretty much tank um, when CD sales and record sales disappeared and it happened really quickly. It was very discouraging. Uh, and then it kind of plateaued and, and then it, there was a really confusing time where nobody really knew what was going on. And then everybody had to kind of figure this stuff out again. And, and then you see the emergence of, of sound exchange. Um, you have the MLC now on online. So I, I, I see it as this big dip and now it's come, it's coming back up again. And, and in reality, this is like probably the best time ever for, for independent creatives. Uh, you can make a living. You just have to do it. You have to, you have to create content and put it out there and do good work. And, and all of these, there aren't, there aren't uh, record companies or publishers or people that are in, that are going to interfere with your royalty stream. So it's a great time. Yes. It is. Hey, Chris, um, Chris, do you have any connections with Alexa or Siri that could, you know, when we shout out in the house, Alexa, play, such as, such as, uh, they actually say the name, right? <laughs> Ah, I'm I just am, joking. Uh, I'm just joking. <laughs> I am on a first name basis with them, but I don't think that's Are different you? from anybody else. <laughs> we have Alexa in our kitchen too. Like is I, the I, of lie, you know. I will I will speak to the head of the VP of development for Amazon about oh. relearning Hawaiian language and you can help us bring together Puakea awesome. and people, uh, <laughs> to assist in this. I'm sure Kalani would also want to be part of that. Uh, and uh, um, Chris, any final thoughts from you? Um, I would echo what Charles said. I, I do think in many respects, this is um, probably the best time really in, in, in modern times to be a creator because you have access to every part of the industry globally. Um, and again, that means that you can be as successful as anyone, and not only be from a place like Hawaii, but you can stay there and still be successful. Um, and so I think that's very encouraging. I, I also think um, what Georgia, your organization is doing is actually the formula for success. Um, the Music Modernization Act was passed in part because a really broad coalition of stakeholders agreed that this was a better path forward. And, and like most things in our world, um, consensus drives progress. When we don't agree, things tend not to happen. So I think the more that you um, can act as a hub for the different creative communities in Hawaii, um, and the more that you can help people um, to think holistically about what, um, what all that creative creativity represents, um, not only locally, but as Nalani said, around the world, I think the more success that you will have. You have one thing that very few places have, and that is um, even though um, only a small number of people live there and maybe a smaller, a slightly larger group have been there, I don't know of a person in the world who if given the chance wouldn't jump at the chance to go to Hawaii. So <laughs> it's through your creative output that you actually bring Hawaii to all of us. And that is something incredibly compelling. I know that I have personally um, enjoyed that throughout my life. So I think you've got the foundation and I think working together as you do um, in a way that many other places do not. Um, you are doing what you need to do. And so I would say do more. And we're just thrilled to be able to partner with you and to be a part of that. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, for me, um, you know, this job has meant a lot because all the things that I learned from my little uh, lower middle class upbringing in arts, music, dance, recording, <laughs> everything, filmmaking, seem to wind up in, in this job. And I take it very seriously. I have a passion for us elevating this story uh, to a, a, a global level. And we got to start with us here at home first. There's never been a better time for creatives in Hawaii, especially for the export of their IP. Now that we have programs like Creative Lab and others that are helping to develop the business 
skills of our artists in all genres, it's very important that we keep growing that. Uh, I do see that there are a lot of other questions that we didn't get to in the chat. Thank you for such a lively over 50 questions today. Um, fantastic. Uh, great to hear from all of you. I hope we've answered a lot. What we'll do is we'll take these questions and we will respond back to them, um, post them on our website. You can find that at creativelab.hawaii.gov. Uh, we are recording this, so it'll be free to share with your friends via Facebook Live. I do want to thank my partner and um, who's always in our corner for all of our creatives here in Hawaii, Jeff Hansen from uh, Senator Hirono's office in DC, as well as Kehau Yap here locally. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with all of you and the entire team at MLC and all of our colleagues here with us today. Uh, remember that Hawaii's opportunity in the world is to share this spirit of why this place is so important for us and why it attracts so many. Uh, Aloha is something that is uh, tangible in an intangible way. And it's always communicated through the music and dance of this place and all the cultures that have come here. So thank you again for being part of this. Ahui ho, and we will see you next time. Aloha all.